Hello. Oh, that was a great welcome. Can we have it again? I, I'm just a little bit uh, intrigued by the sharing person saying that the pastor was smiling all the time. When it comes, it, he was smiling. Now, it, does that mean pastors that come to this church don't smile? Wow. Praise the Lord, I, I smile. Well, glad to be back here with you all. It's been uh, a year, I think. Let me get to the show. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, you saw the uh, announcement, Pastor Albert and Ming from Salt Shakers Church. Some of you may wonder what's that name all about. Okay, uh, when we planted the church for four years, uh, five years now, we thought the Lord wanted us to uh, uh, shake the salt out into the marketplace. That's why I call ourselves the Salt Shakers Church. I see uh, familiar faces. Glad to be back here with you. Uh, before we start the Word of God, let's just have a word of prayer. Father, thank you once again to invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us. Lord, not just only through uh, the uh, words I speak, but Lord, that you may impact hearts directly and that you may touch us and give us strength in the days to come. So Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Can I have the PowerPoint up, please? That's right. I'll leave it there for a while, right? Do I have to move the slide or what? Very up. Now before I start, let me just share uh, something which I heard only this Friday, right? And uh, we have our men's connect group. Now we have a lot of uh, Bible storing groups. Uh, we are the Bible storing church. So some of you probably may not know what we do, but uh, we tell Bible stories and then we discuss the Bible in small groups. So on, men, um, on Friday, we had a men's group, and that was the day before uh, Typhoon Zone. And so quite a number couldn't turn up because they were caught in the jam. But I, uh, one of them was near where I stayed, and we went, uh, he, he and I met, and uh, we talked. So I had a good talk with him. Uh, he was a pastor before, right? Uh, but he had uh, sort of quit his pastoral work and is now helping a church. Uh, being a cell leader and being a member of a church. Now, the story he tells me about himself was, in a sense, a very challenging story because I think this is the reality of life. And we sing a lot of songs about Lord, we love you to the end, kind of thing. But the reality of life is that our faith will always be challenged. We are living in a world where Satan wants to crush your faith, destroy you. If he doesn't take you out of the church, he will probably sort of like uh, make you no longer fruitful. You continue coming to church, but it's no longer fruitful. It's like a habit. We come on Sunday and we go back home and life is a, the normal, usual drag kind of thing. The rest of the Bible does say about an abundant life that each of us are supposed to live. Well, it tells a story when he first gave up his job and became a pastor in a church somewhere down in one time or so. And he said that the, uh, in, in that church there, they, they didn't much believe in uh, supporting pastors. So he gave up his job and he was serving without pay, right? And he was serving without pay, and, and, but people were kind to him. They gave him money. And so it was like people were supporting him. And then he moved to Penang. And the church there, uh, he was with one of the group of those churches. And, and in Penang itself too, uh, there wasn't much income for him, but he loved the Lord, he served the Lord, he believed that God had given him the call, and he started to serve the Lord with all his heart. Again, I think income was not sufficient, but uh, uh, people gave him love games and kind of thing. So that was the way he had been living. And uh, his older brother, about 10 years older, now he's about 65, right? his older brother is about 10 years older than him, uh, never was a Christian. And his old brother had a fallout with him and said, you give your life to the church, you know, and who's going to take care of you? But his older brother himself was quite a, quite a wealthy person and uh, sort of had the break with him. And, but the story goes on is that he, this, this man, had a problem in his church. 
you know, church usually can come to some church problems here and there. And uh, the result was that he left the church and he left being a pastor. And, uh, and he had no money. And he was saying that uh, uh, his brother, older brother, tell him, you and I, different spirit. I'm Buddhist. You're Christian. I cannot help you. And he, and he wanted to do this. He says, I want to show him that my God cares for me and that my God will provide. So he worked two jobs. So he worked very hard, two jobs. And uh, one was, I forgot, but anyway, uh, in the nighttime, he was doing some food business and kind of thing. And he managed to uh, survive over those years. And then he didn't have his daytime job. And he started to take his food to do it like a regular business. But income was not so good. And uh, at this point of time, he gets rather less than uh, uh, maybe 800 from his food uh, business and about 200 ringgit from, uh, from his delivery. He, he worked for an office as a delivery boy to supplement about $1,000. And he says he was eating up his savings. Uh, out of his savings, he's been able to buy a small little low-cost house and he was staying there. He's single, alone. And, uh, uh, and so as we were talking, uh, he began to say, you know, Pastor, I'm really, really concerned about the age, the time when I reach 75 and I cannot work. And uh, what's going to happen to me? Uh, well, old folks home, uh, you still have to pay, right? And uh, you're not sure whether the church is with will pay for him. So he was like in the place where he's saying, I give my all to God. And I'm in a situation like this today. Story is not finished yet. We're still having a connect group. Huh? And uh, we probably, I, I did talk to him. I said, the one developer that I know had uh, spoken to me uh, maybe about half a year ago and says that he's got a piece of land in uh, in the mainland, in, in Pry or one of those areas there. He intended to develop it into a community, uh, into a, a nursing home kind of thing. And he says that I will develop it, I'll pay for everything to do it, but can I coordinate with the pastors to form a group that will run it? And, but you have to make it a going concern because he will not be pouring money into it. So I spoke to him, I said, I'm not sure he has, can, he will continue to do this, but uh, uh, there could be a possibility that we could uh, have a home for taking care of people like you, you know, and and, and, and so we left it like that. The reason I tell you this story is because I think the scripture I'm going to tell you from is a very familiar scripture. You all know it. Isaiah 40, 25 to 31. Um, and the scripture just says that, uh, to whom will you liken me to? And to whom shall I be, uh, shall be my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. Who brings out the stars by number and he calls them all by name. And by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do, why do you say, Jacob, and why do you speak, Israel? My ways are hidden from my Lord and my just claims are passed over by my God. Had you not uh, heard, have you not known, the everlasting God, your Lord, the creators of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. Even the youth shall be weary and faint, and your young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait Upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like the eagle. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. We all know that scriptures very familiar with us. But I do believe that there are many Christians today who know a scripture from, from reading it, but do not know it experientially. Experientially. And that's where my challenge to you this this morning how do i get to know this scripture experientially now when this when isaiah spoke this verse to israel israel was into the uh, into the promised land for many years already and they were about ready to be judged okay and uh and and taken away into captivity 
and Isaiah was prophesying, and starting from chapter 40 onward, after the first 39 chapters of many woes and judgment, he begins to prophesy about the coming seven king and about the future, the seven king who will set his people free as it were. But how did Israel get to the place where the Lord said to them, I hate your gathering together, uh, so holy assemblies, I hate your feast. Where did, how did they get to the place where whatever they seem to do in religious duty to the Lord, the Lord said, I hate it. Because the heart was no longer there. And the Lord said, come reason together that your sin may be removed from you. You know, when Egypt was, when Israel was just taken out of Egypt, they saw the wonders of God. They saw the greatness of God. Right? Because the plagues, uh, not the plagues, but the, uh, the ten, yeah, the ten things that God, uh, Moses performed in Egypt, all right, and caused the glory of God to be seen by the people of Egypt. So that finally, they released Israel. It was a wonderful sign of the greatness and the all of awesomeness of their God. And in fact, after they left and, and uh, Moses led them through the place where it was like a trap, right? It was by the seashore and the, and the Egyptians, uh, Pharaoh and his army was chasing after them. But the Lord said to Moses, stand still and see the deliverance of God and I will cause your enemies to be destroyed and you will see their bodies on the shore. That was happening. So Israel saw the greatness of God. They went through the wilderness. They disobeyed God. They complained about God. And uh, they had to spend 40 years wandering until the first generation passed away. And the second generation, in fact, just before they entered into the promised land, they did the same thing. Second generation of the younger ones from 20 years below was uh, as uh, Moses led them. Near to the ending, again, there was the same, the same challenge. There was not enough water to complain against God. And, uh, and then there was, the, uh, there was the other time that uh, the Lord sent this fiery serpent to destroy them. But they got into the promised land. And in the time of the judges, we know, we know the history of that. In the time of the judges, what happened was that the people kept reverting back to idol worship. So the point I'm making is this, is that, you know, discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction, okay? You're always going the same direction no matter what happens. And, and the challenge is, along the way, we can lose that sense of awe when you first accept. I trust that when you first accepted the Lord, there was, there was a moment of a glimpse of the glory of God and the greatness of God in your life. And you came out feeling the sense that God is with you, this great joy kind of thing. I remember I was born in the Christian home, okay? Not that I remember I was born in the Christian home, but I remember that when I was 10 years old, <laughs> I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in Ipoh here, okay? That was the time when uh, the, this uh, uh, film actress uh, went through uh, uh, Ipoh, you know, through the Methodist churches in uh, the Church of Ipoh and those kind of churches started through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My mother was with the Cantonese Methodist Church and she and she was at those meetings and there was tremendous power demonstrated through this evangelist lady who was a famous film actress from Hong Kong as well. And the result of it was that this group of churches started, Church of Ipoh, Penang, Church of Singapore, they started because uh, they had to leave their churches because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And my mother saw the hand of, uh, saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she was baptized in the Holy Spirit at home, not in the church meeting. And when she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, you know, it caused quite a bit of uh, worries and fear to my dad, who was saying, what's happening to my wife? She's crying and laughing and speaking in tongues. She's speaking nonsense and called all the, the sons and the daughters to come. And we came and we saw, but she said, everything is okay, don't worry about it. And then the next day, she said to us, the children, would you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I said, and we said, yes. 
because she's our mother who led us through Bible studies once a while. And so she prayed for us. She laid hands on us. And I remember when she laid hands on me, the Holy Spirit came on me. It wasn't, you know, sometimes people get worried, you know, uh, are you being cycled into these things, you know. But when she laid hands on me, I started to, to feel the warmth of God for filling my whole body. And I started to keep praying. In the, uh, tongues came out from me and I was praying in tongues. And it was so awesome. I knew as a young boy that there is a God. An awesome God. And I've never left Him since then. And I want to share part of why I've never left Him since then. Through this experience. But I want to ask how many of you, when you come to know the Lord, had an experience of an encounter with God. That's what it is to be born again. To have a new life. Not just decide to go to a church or become a Christian and experience of that. But the truth is that with many people that we have known who started this way as well, there are many I know who have fallen by the wayside. Obedience in the same direction, a lifetime of obedience in the same direction is not an easy thing unless you understand how God strengthens us. So that's why I want to this morning just bring to you uh, this kind of this experience and to challenge you to, uh, to develop something in your life that will take you through every challenge of life, right? I press the arrow up one, right? Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, the first part of it, when, when the prophet spoke to, uh, when the prophet spoke to uh, Israel, the first part of it, he was speaking to a people who were defeated, who really was destroyed by idolatry. And uh, the first part really was to show this incomparable God. Because this is what he says. Who, to whom will you liken me to? And to whom shall I be? He says the Holy One. In other words, he's telling them, Hey, who am I? Who will you compare me to? I am the Lord, okay? And he asked them to lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. Who brings out their hosts. Now the host speaks about all the stars and all those things. He brings them out by number. Now, the, the, the world, that we, the universe that we live in is so awesomely great. Even our uh, galaxy itself is just a small part of it. There are many, many more galaxies. This awesome God. What he says is that if you lift up your eyes and see who created these things, this is the same God who brings out these hosts by number. And he calls them all by name. This awesome God that you and I believe in. Now, it is not just a little God that we come on Sunday and then we want to ask him something. And then, but the truth of it is that he's an awesome God. But does that reality strikes us today in the churches? Do the Christians of the city and the Christians in our, in our nation realize, realize meaning not just intellectually, but deep in their heart and knowing without a shadow of doubt that our God is awesome. If you look at the universe, you look at this host of stars, He calls them all by name and the, by the greatness of His might and by the strength of His power, not one is missing. Wow. You know how many things you miss in your house? And you forget, where did I put this? Where did I put that? Especially when you reach the age, like some of us are reaching, yeah? we forget more than where we put things. Sometimes we forget so many things. Huh? Even the names, I think I met you before, but sorry, yeah, I don't know your name. I wonder how many people say that. Yeah? We do that, right? And so, the Lord reminded Israel, and it says that, who are you going to liken me to? Today, this morning, let me pose this same question to you. You may be tired. You may be just, make, you know, just going, coasting through. Uh, you come to church on Sunday, but uh, the awareness of the greatness of God and the sense of His awe in your life is no longer there. Is it possible to constantly have such a sense of His awesomeness? Now, I'm not just talking about feelings alone. Feelings come and go. But the deep knowledge, the deep revelation in us that the God we believe in is an awesome God. Why do we need to believe that? It's important because that's the beginning of that 
walk with God that will cause you to be obedient in the long direction, because in, in the same direction. Because if God is the awesome God who names the stars, who calls them all, and by His greatness of His might and by the strength of His power, not one is missing. You know, recently I read somewhere that the entire galaxy seems to be missing from the, uh, the, the, the scientists. Uh, they were looking at it, it was expanding very fast. Suddenly, hey, it's not there. They're wondering whether it became a black hole or what. They missed it in, amongst all the things they're looking at. But God doesn't even miss one little star. Awesomeness of our God. So the incomparable God. So when Isaiah painted that picture of the awesomeness of God, he turns it over now and he gives us this picture of the weakness of man. And I want to speak about that because no matter how strong you think you are, the attrition of life, because sometimes things don't happen the way you pray for it, the way we've been taught to believe. Something, sometimes things happen to us that makes us sad, unhappy. It could be your relate, it could be your children. It could be your business. It could be so many things. But, you know, the attrition of life is that we go through challenges. And uh, so, and that's the truth, right? So, why do you, uh, and so that's why the scripture for this one says, uh, oops. Oh. oh, I'm going, oh, oh, down. <laughs> yeah, this one is a bit complicated, this one. <laughs> Okay, okay. Then the Lord said, well, Jacob, okay, Jacob refers to uh, Israel. Nah? Jacob, remember Jacob? You know, he, he and his brother Esau had this fight uh, and he stole from his brother, cheated his brother, had to run away. And then when he was coming back, he had to struggle with God at the river. Uh, and then uh, by, and when, and when the Lord dealt with him, the Lord changed his name to Israel. And Jacob's 12 sons, or Israel's 12 sons, became the nation of Israel. We all know this. Huh? So why do you say, Jacob? Why do you speak Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed away by my God. And that's the reality of life. I, I like people who testify about the victory of God. And it is true, there's always victory of God coming. But there are many who are silent who would say, where is God with me? And I don't know whether that resounds with you and resonates in your heart at the moment that you are struggling with some issues. Can we believe in a God who is great and awesome? You see, awesome and great to somebody else, but not to me. So why my ways are hidden from the Lord? He is saying is that everybody says that God is so good, but it seems like He has not seen me. He lost me. Though He doesn't, no stars get is missed by Him, but somehow this little person like I am, God missed me. Right? My ways are hidden from God. My just claims. Now the word just claims tells us that this is something you you think I deserve it. And sometimes we carry out all the teachings of people who say five steps to success. And we do all those things. And I should be successful. I give my tithes. I do this. I do that. I should. And so I have a just claim on you. But God seems to pass by over me. I'm not, I'm not suggesting for once that everything we pray from God will be answered. Though sometimes people seem to believe it. So, but this, re this reflects the human weakness, the human frailty that we need to overcome. But I thank God the thing moves on next and, and it moves on to the good news. The good news. So have you not heard? Have you not, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, your Lord, the Lord, the, cre the, everla uh, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. So what's God?
God's response. God's response is that, Hey, I am, have you not heard? Have you not known? I am the everlasting God, the Lord. When you say the Lord, the phrase is the Lord over everything, the one who rules over heavens and earth, over you. I am the everlasting God. The term everlasting God seems to give to me that this God is from beginning to the end. And at one point, at one time on our television, you have the battery that never runs out, right? What's the battery called? Aberdeen. Yeah, yeah, yeah Duracell. The rabbit goes on and on and on and on and on. In the picture, God doesn't run out of energy. He goes on and on and on. God is always there, beginning to the end. But Lord, that's nice to know, but what about me? Frail human being like me, you seem to pass me by. I hear good testimonies. I hear healing. I hear um, God acting on other people's be uh, behalf. But my just claims, I have done the things that you want me to do, but it's not happening to me. He's not weary, and he does not faint. He's an everlasting God. And the last tense says that his understanding is unsearchable. Well, it simply tells us that the infinite God, we cannot understand, especially if we are in the midst of going through the challenge of life, and the heaven is, is, is like brass, and God is silent. But Isaiah do have a word for it in the scripture. It says that huh? when you are in darkness, it says don't light your own fire. Because that's what people like to do. When I don't understand what God is doing, I light my fire. I try to find my understanding from this and from that. And it will give you more pain. You go and read the scripture, you find it. What's, what's God asking us to do? He says it trust. And I don't... But, but one of the encouraging things about life is this. Even though the fig tree does not blossom... I will still trust in the Lord. Even though in my life, this 70, 80 years, even if God doesn't seem to do what I want, but I do understand that His understanding I can't search. I don't know why He's withholding it from me, but I do know that that's the goodness of God. He has a plan for me that I may not understand. His ways are unsearchable. All I need is to thank God. I have a future. I have an eternity. All right? I may pass from this earth without having all my dreams fulfilled, but uh, I know at the end of the day, in the city which He has built, that's my home. You know the faith chapter in chapter 11? They all were looking for a city not built by hand, but built by God. And though some of the things they were promised to them did not happen, Yet, they continue believing God. But that needs a lot of strength. Because the weakness of men would be when we don't see the things we want, we say, God, you've forgotten me. You left me behind. But God has not. Now, I'm not promising you like some people will say, okay, you do this, I pray for you, and you will see your answer. But I'm promising you strength because I've got a God who strengthens through all these things. Okay? His understanding is unsearchable. So that's the good news. And then of course the next one is, oops, wait, I go back long ago. The God who strengthens. The word strengthens is to increase our capacity for exertion or endurance. Power to go resist, force or attack. So when he increase our strength, he gives us the ability to go through, to endure. Now, God works different ways. And I've seen God works in deliverance. Now, for us and my wife, I think I've shared this testimony when my daughter was, uh, she was still very young, in lower six, lower six, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And at that time, we were so taken back by it. So uh, when the news came, uh, the doctor called us on the phone, you know, your, your very niece <laughs> just go numb on you. And it's like cancer. The big C word is very frightening. But we prayed through and. In our commitment, we prayed and said, no matter what happens, we will still serve the Lord. I mean, the initial thought first was, Lord, I'm serving you. I'm a pastor. Why do you allow this to happen? Why do you allow this to happen? So, but we got ourselves together. We prayed and we 
decided once and for all, doesn't matter what kind of challenges come my life, we will still serve the Lord. And for my daughter, it was the same thing. We spoke to her and said, what if the Lord doesn't heal you? Uh, maybe she doesn't really know enough uh, kind of thing, but she was very bold to say, so I go home to the Lord. Well, operated on, treated. She's, she's doing well in Melbourne, serving the Lord, uh, and now in Bible school. She was with Wycliffe. She, she studied to become a pharmacist first. She quit her pharmacy and joined Wycliffe as a mission and mission organization. And then now she's in Bible school. Still, every year, we're checked up, all clear. A wonderful testimony of the goodness of God, right? But while you clap, remember many Christians whose loved ones died of cancer. So, for us to claim that there will always be healing is actually sometimes a, uh, a very damaging thing to people whose loved ones are lost. Then they will ask themselves, well, was I not good enough? Did I not pray enough? Did I... So, and these are all in the imponderable uh, wisdom of God, unsearchable. But the promise is that He will strengthen. Right? And, the, and the verse that we have here is this verse. He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. In life, we can be assured of this. He will give strength to you. He will give strength, power to the weak, and to those who have no might, He will increase strength. I don't know how you feel today. Maybe you are on top of the hill and you're doing well. Praise God. All right? But you still need to do something to prepare for whatever Satan may throw across your path. But if you are struggling in some area and you find that you don't have strength itself to overcome and you're about to give up, there are many Christians who give up. Or if they, I don't mean they give up and leave the church, they give up looking to God and uh, believing in the good and wonderful God and they come to church and, and they're infected. Their witness is no longer infected because it's like, you know, they find it hard to testify about a God who doesn't answer them and give them the things they want. You see, young people will even faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall. But God says He will give strength, power to those who are weak, and strength to those, or might to those who are uh, those who are weak. And then that's the one. He's going to give us wings. So the remaining part is, but those who wait on the Lord. Now, this is a lot of people have memorized this. Huh? And it, I don't want it to be just in your mind. But those who wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like the eagle, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. We know how eagles soar, right? Many people would have told you that. Unlike a sparrow, the small bird that just keeps flapping, flapping with a lot of energy to lift itself to fly, the eagle just catches the wind of the spirit. If a storm comes, it just catches the wind, and the wind will take it up. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. To wait on Him to renew their strength. So that's the power. The waiting on the Lord. But again, this could be just another scripture verse that we learn. But the practice of it misses us. How do we wait? For some, the idea about waiting is just to take time. I wait. I will suggest to you something that you and I can start to build now. You know, before trouble comes, we build our resources. We learn how to wait on the Lord, right? And I'm not just saying waiting means you have to come to a prayer meeting. It is a personal thing that you have to learn. You and I have to learn, okay? They shall mount up with wings as the eagle. And you know when the eagles fly, uh, soar up high, you know, from where it is, the, the sharpness of his eyes, you can see far ahead. You know, when I see the Lord and I, from the, from the vista high up, carried by the wind of the Spirit in the relationship with God, and I look far down in, into, into the future through the Word of God, it, it comforts me no end. And I know one day I will die. 
we will die one day. We will lay our head down and die. And sometimes we struggle now. You know, when you're a certain age, huh? and you can't do a lot of things that you want to do, your body is weak and kind of thing, and you start to lose a bit of your hearing. I, I, I wear hearing aid now, but I didn't wear it today. Yeah, <laughs> uh, And things are happening in life, and you don't like it. Now, at my age, it's not so bad. But when you reach 80, 90, and that's when my friend was worried. He says, I'm now able to survive. I'm still working. But when I reach 75, 80, and if I'm not home with the Lord yet, life is not going to be easy. As I feel the challenge to the churches, especially for those of us in Malaysia. Malaysia, while we are happy for those uh, young churches that are growing strength to them, right? They need to reach out to young people. In uh, Young people, I, I see you have a lot of young people, right? Praise God. Nah? Yeah. Yeah. But my church, our pastor, um, they all attracted to my age. So <laughs> I have a few young people, but most of them, not a very big church, but most of them are 50, 60 and above. All right? Okay? So what do we worry about? But most of them are retirees. They are baby boomers. Uh, they've got money to travel around here. And they're now enjoying themselves, okay? Right? You have your money and you, uh, you retire. You, you enjoy yourself. But there comes a time when you are weak and without strength. You, you know, thank God if you have money when you are weak and old. Your money can give you a lot more comfort. But like this friend of mine, he has no money, he has nothing, and he's afraid of the future. I would say that, uh, you know, the fact that the remaining part of our life is not necessarily all glory, but weakness is actually a grace of God. Not just so much for yourself, but for us as human beings to realize that our end is all in weakness and in suffering. But there's a world after that that makes it worth it. So hang on there, brothers and sisters. When you're 80, you're 90, and life becomes so much more difficult. No matter how your children may make it comfortable for you, but if you're a single and there's no one to take care of you, hang on there. All right, God will give you the strength to go through. But my challenge to churches in the city is this. One church alone cannot do it. But the churches, and that's, I hope that's what the Lord wants us to do in Penang with that piece of land. The churches can come together and do it on a bigger scale because many people are going to need it. We are an aging church today. Most of the older ones that had a renewal in the 80s, 90s, most of us are aging. The young churches, praise God for them. All strength to them. Win more young people. Go ahead and do all that you have. You know, but God has called some of us to really look into the future as an eagle soaring up there, understanding myself. Now, give me about 10, 20 years ago, I wouldn't think like that because I'm still, I have got great vision. I want to do this, I want to do that, I do that. But when I planted my church at 60 years old, I knew that I got 10 active years. Beyond that, I'm not sure. And I wanted to do one that was Disciple making to make sure people are strong in the Lord, strong in the Lord through the Word of God. And uh, I begin to sort of like comprehend a little bit more because now I've gone to 66. And before long, I'll be 70. And uh, I praise God, I hope no, no sickness come and I'll still be preaching, I'll still be doing the things of God, but of course at a slower pace. There's still one of the one of the vision or the challenge for me in our church is that there's still a lot of life for those of us who are 60, 70. A lot of things God wants to be used for. You just get a, you just get to be strong in the Lord, right? And move with the Lord. So I'm going to just close with this final thought. What is this waiting on the Lord all about? He gives power to the weak, to those who have no might and increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Hey, am I going backwards, sir? Uh, yeah, I want to feel young again, right? Time to turn time backwards. This is the final slide. Yeah? I learned this many years back. First from my elder in the uh, uh, church of Penang. And uh, he, he loves, he's Chinese speaking, but he 
he has his uh, sons who are professors in Singapore and, and they go into the Bible for him. They say one of the meaning of the word of wait upon the Lord is beyond this time. It's, it is twining. The word gava to wait is to twine. It's an active, you know, twining yourself around the Lord. And he gave the example of uh, this ivy plant that twines itself around a tree. Okay? What happens when you twine yourself around the tree? The strength of the tree becomes the strength of that vine. It is hard to break it from then on. And then when I was in Australia uh, in 87 in our school of ministry, Clark Taylor, who was a minister then, spoke about the same thing. He spoke about early morning prayer, where it's not just a list of prayer, it's not just a duty, but he spent time. So I followed, I went with the other pastors who were there. We went early morning to the church, a big church in Brisbane. Uh, Mount Gravet, at 5 to 8 o'clock in the morning, he teaches how to open up the spirit, uh, script, scripture and wait upon the Lord and exchange our weakness of his strength. And you develop that ability to step into the presence of God. You know, I took, we stayed back a few months more and I was invited to a farm by a pastor who was there in, uh, in, in, in uh, Ubumba. And uh, I was a strange sight walking early in the morning with this pink coat. I didn't have somebody, the lady lent me the pink coat. It was very cold. So I'm walking in the field and seeing all the beautiful birds. And I was taking scriptures and I was saying, Lord, uh, uh, thank you, Lord. You take away my weakness. You give me strength and you give me understanding, spiritual revelation. You know, because I knew God had called me more to be a teacher of the word than an evangelist. I said, give me understanding so that when I look at scripture, your revelation will come. And, you know, you're walking, pacing, you're praying, you're speaking to God out of scripture, and you're developing that sense of the presence of God, the awesomeness of God. And I had that breakthrough in my life because from then on, when I come back home, from then on, every time I want to enter his presence, it's just like, now I'm here. I'm in His presence because I've learned to tune my heart to the Lord. That's waiting on God. I want to challenge you. And now for me as a Pentecostal uh, race, yeah, when many, more, many times when I, I come to the presence of God, I just pray in tongues. My understanding is unfruitful, but my spirit has been built up. I pray in tongues. I pray in tongues. I pray in tongues. And how do I pray in the scripture? I take from Psalms 150 chapters. I take chapter 1. I say, I thank you, Lord. I'm blessed. I will stand in the place of the sinners. I see the sea is harmful or not in the path of me, whatever. I've got to miss that. But, you know, I'm like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. And in the confession, as you're speaking, spending time, you're not coming to God and giving Him a list, Lord, please help me, this, 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 that. You are just spending time to be with God. And He speaks to you out of the scripture. So, my challenge, brothers and sisters, when you're young, develop that. You know how, so that you know how to enter the presence of God and constantly know the greatness of God in your life. You need to know that. If you are, haven't done that before, it's never too late. God delights to fellowship with us. God delights to meet us and minister to us. And that's the burden and challenge I have for many Christians who have gone through the renewal in the 80s or early 80s or early 90s. And uh, the, 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 the fizz have gone out of their lives. And you're still there, you know. And it's good that you're still there, holding on. But let's bring the fizz back. If, you're, if your walk with the Lord has not been what it should be, that's all you need to do. Come back. And it takes time. You know, understanding how to break into God's presence takes time. None of these things are, oh, today I do it, tomorrow I know what it is like. But I guarantee you, once you know how to enter the presence of God through the confession, through the prayer kind of thing, it becomes easier the next time you enter into it. And that's my encouragement for you this morning. In, uh, uh, after that, uh, I don't know what you do here. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. But uh, we, we would love to pray with people my wife and I just after the service, uh, just come and see us after the service. Let me just pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord. Your word is life to us. And Father, it's not just meant to be some teachings from mind. 
is practical. We can live out of that word. And may you bless your people through this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.